So we're gonna, this is a, uh, welcome to the uh, knockoff, hard to stop. Um, this is gonna be pretty straightforward. Um, basically I wanted to get some of the anecdotal stories that you guys have to tell about why you're doing this, but also the kind of work that you do, what you normally do under your name versus under these names. Um, and I guess, you know, we can start off just kind of casually talking about what, um, why we all ended up here, why you were suckers enough to do this crazy project that I asked you to do. Uh, and then we'll kind of walk through, I'll get you guys to talk about the specifics of the piece, what you're doing, the, the, the shift when you start making the piece that you really start thinking about, like the artist. And I think that's kind of the interesting thing, this kind of role that you play, that you also play with your own work, like you get into a certain step and you start making rules for yourself with your work, like it has to be this way. And I think that, not the formal rules-based stuff, but just kind of your studio approach to the stuff. So anyway, thank you for coming. We have a beautiful day here in Boston, drawing everyone to the parks. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, so I guess we'll, Sheila, we'll start with you since you're on the end. And I think you had an a interesting kind of story of, um, you know, it was a, kind of a combination of being introduced to the knockoff rather suddenly and, and having to think of who you could do just forgeries of. Um, and, and you know, I'll talk more about the, the lines we're drawing in the show about what what's a knockoff, what's, what's a, a copy, what's a fake, yeah. what's mm -hmm. uh, and how that works. But um, I just thought that was such a great kind of story because it's like oh, surprising at the same time, totally sound like a fun project to do. <laughs> Did you the Joyce Krieger project? Yeah. Yeah, that um, I used to show with Joyce Krieger at Krieger Dean, mm -hmm. and on the side, besides from having the gallery, she had a business selling to hotels and to casinos and things like that. So she got a big job out in Las Vegas to do, um, to supply this huge hotel with all of this art and she brought a big portfolio out there and the hotel said, yeah, no, we want this Joan Snyder, you know, this Wade Hoffer, this John Gibson. And then she went around to the galleries in Boston and they didn't give her any discount even though they were her gallery friends. She said, no, I can't sell the Joe Snyder for like 40,000 bucks. And she realized that would blow her entire budget because she had already signed on for the deal. So I said, I'll do a Joe Snyder and a Wade Offer and a John Gibson for you. So I did for like two months. I ripped off all of these artists and how I got, and the, actually I think my Joe Snyder is better than the Joe Snyder. That's the part. I, and and, and, and uh, got really into like trying to make the work from sort of the bottom up and getting into the artist's head. Uh, Wade Hoffer was eating. I couldn't do, and I think I can do anything, you know, I couldn't do those, you know those, those Gibson balls he shows there? Michael Gibson, yeah. Yeah, is that his name? I'm just telling you, at Miller Block, those perfect reflective balls, really, really hard. So how I got around the um, criminal edge was I just said, ooh, that I named them all, ooh, ooh, to, to, ooh to Jim Snyder, <laughs> ooh to Wade Hoffer, ooh to, yeah. Kind of like you do with songs, I guess. Yeah. It's like, oh, the hush. So yeah, they're all over in the Summerlands Hotel. So you made how many different people? I made um, through Wade Hopper, Jim Snyder, then or some artists I didn't even know, like a TV watercolor. Yes, from, from, from New England, yeah. So were they pretty large scale? That's why yeah, they're $40,000. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Jim Snyder is big, you know, big painting. Wade Hopper's, yeah, those were like four by five paintings. So. And how much, I mean, you go back and look kind of at the, at the range of work that you're, I mean, I found when you go back and look at the thing you thought of doing and you learn more, you're like, see, bunch of other paintings, you're like, well, I didn't even know they did this. It's like, wow, I've got more latitude than I thought if I'm working in the style of. Yeah, no, and it's actually a great way to teach yourself how to paint, too. I mean, you can really figure, figure stuff out. Did, did you feel like that informed your work later? Like, having gone well, through all of that, did you then sort of, like, well, it helps in teaching, teaching actually. In it helps in teaching, being able to sort of enter these different processes and ways of making work. Mm -hmm. um, but I had ripped off, I mean, not really ripped off, but I'd done the whole, you know, recreating Monet's by the Living Flowers yeah. at the museum. You just moved one of those on Friday. For oh, you did? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> They're doing fine. Good, good. Um, and that was out of a desire to see that. I started making those huge mm -hmm. flower replicas of Impressionist paintings. Um, because That came out of an artist garden show at the BCA. There was this desire to, how do you make Monet come alive again when he'd been on, like, every, you know, mouse pad, coffee cup, toilet paper, bus, bath, mat. And uh, 
so that's when I started doing um, doing those works. But I learned a huge amount about those too, about sort of like going and finding your brush stroke in the um, you know in the flower market every day, and just how you look so much more carefully when you have to do something like that. But with that was really more my desires, like how do you how do you get people back to really looking at the art that had been so unbelievably commodified and replicated. I think there is a really significant shift when you start making it. I mean, even when you've got the supplies and you've done the research, but as soon as you start actually making it, and you find either you find that they're like it's a lot harder to make, which is you generally you, that's you know that's the case with the first half, you know, until you figure out like some shortcuts or a technique. And then the other thing is you. I know Susie and I were experiencing the thing, and then Danielle, um, Denise, Danielle, <laughs> Denise. I'm having a name thing. That's good. I can get it. But that, like, you start feeling like you're getting a lot done. This isn't going to take very long. Wow, yeah. it's going really yeah. fast. And all of a sudden, it comes yeah. to a screeching halt, and you're like, this is harder than I thought. Middle section, <laughs> yeah. treading water yeah. for a while. Yeah. Going, Whoa, why do you, yeah. you know? And you're like, then you start thinking of like, well, I could leave out a step, and yeah. then you find yourself going, but I can't. Yeah. yeah. You know, so it's it's funny because a lot of these things are laborious, like step by step processes that you realize are the that's the very reason why all these assistants help make them. Because, it, but then it's that's kind of admirable because the artist is like, I'm not willing to give up the steps even if I have to do two of these in two different countries at the same time. Yeah, I want them to be. They have to have this certain way of being made. They have to have the certain edge. They have to have, you know, the smoothness. You were talking about doing eight coats of on that solid whip piece, yeah. and you were saying that like laying down and sealing the tape on Barry McGee's. You, yeah. you guys tried to talk him into letting you. Yeah, and, he was and just like, yeah. So I think it's interesting. He wanted us to do that. Here. Oh, it has to be. But from over here, it looks great. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> no one's going to know this. Yeah. So I think you have an interesting perspective, kind of working directly with an artist and then having him leave you notes and not be there directly overseeing you and kind of staking out, putting your tent posts out to kind of see what range you were free to do whatever you wanted and what things were specific the rules that you couldn't break that the artist yeah. set up. Because there was always a little bit of fun, which I think you make for yourself to keep yourself entertained by yeah. any job. Yes. <laughs> and if the job happens to be art making, um, that part of it, I, I think it'd be interesting to hear like what those, like what, how far you could push the boundaries and where he said, okay, you can't do that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because when you're, you know, working as an installer in a museum, your employer is the museum. And then you, you know, these artists come to do these site-specific installations. And over the last year, I've been working on a like a bunch of them. The artists coming, and then you're assigned to be their their assistant, but only for like a couple weeks. So you like learn the process. You do it for a couple weeks, and then you just like send it on its way. And that's different because then in the back of your head, you have you're like, yes, I'm working for you, but I'm working for the museum too. Right. So when when working on the Barry installation, there was some stuff that would just take such a long time that sometimes you had to stand up to him and be like, we got to get moving. It's this is opening in two days. Oh, you so know, but if you're... So you had the same worries as you have when you're getting you stuff of your own ready Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> you're still thinking about it opening in the museum and who you're working for, but then you're working for this other artist. He was interesting to work for. He was really nice and everything, but he didn't communicate well at all. And he was not passive aggressive, just pretty passive altogether. <laughs> and, um, we would, you know, work on these panels all day long and just like panels, panels, panels. And it was just, it was pretty, it was like driving us crazy because it was myself and Eddie working on it. And uh, the rest of the crew got to do like other other okay. things. And we were just doing panels. We were on panel duty. And uh, we would leave and Barry would stay really late and then we'd get in the next day and there he'd write us notes. <laughs> and we were just like so we were just like, oh man. And his notes were <laughs> his like, notes were like bad yeah, tape job here. Yeah, it was like, you know, stop with the crazy colors or, you know, um, make cleaner lines and make you know, just like we're just like, man, why can't you just tell us when we're making it? Wow, or no, because he was actually, maybe he is there some while you're there.
here. Oh, yeah. But no, it's easier for everybody. We were like, working with him all day, oh, but like, he, say he never said anything to us. And uh, he would just like leave us these notes and stuff like that. Do you think it's because he couldn't respond until he saw it? I just think he has a hard time communicating. <laughs> or or well, it's taunting somebody or criticizing yeah. somebody. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a tough well, yeah. that brings up an interesting, you know, topic. Like, you, here's your responsibility to make great artwork, and then suddenly you need to be a, like a, a, both an instructor of how to make your work, yeah. and a, kind of a, uh, I guess you're the general contractor to try to get the lighting guys and the scaffolding guy and the artist to make it the way you want it. You know, it's like writing an artist thing, but not everybody can be both the painter yeah. and the writer and the logistics person. And it, it is, it, it's, it's, some artists make their work completely themselves as slow as they have to make it because they don't they can't deal with that they don't want to give that away and other artists have to learn like I remember there there have been a few like Sildo Morellis at, uh, at the ICA was like the nicest he was one of the people just kind of understood the little like the positive reinforcement a little bit but also um, made it very clear really early like this has to be perfect this is what I'm looking at this yeah. is the thing have all the fun you want with this area you know, I'm paying attention to this. So it's kind of like, it gave you, you go, okay, I am gonna have to like be completely, you know, ridiculously attentive about this part. Yeah. But the payoff is that that's the only part. And he's made it clear that I can relax a little bit or I won't have this, you know, unending process. There'll be other parts. And you switch back and forth because your brain can't. You know, you really, it's like nice to have drying time, just like it's nice to have the other thing you do. I know people that work really tight like to do like loose bigger things when they're just because you get you know you get a headache or you get like stuck like I'm gonna do some knitting now because I've been you know mixing concrete you know that's kind of like a nice way to switch back and forth but um and what uh, I guess it was interesting you um I wanted to get you guys also to talk about like this shift from I mean is any of this stuff I mean obviously um, Sheila was saying you know it helped your painting and your teaching I was just curious of like, you know, do you, have you done any taping or hard edge lines in your own work? No. So you're, not, you're like, I don't want to. Do I haven't. I mean, it's interesting. I like working with the artist because you do learn like tricks, you know, and it's a great way to like gather different knowledge, even though like most of the time when I'm working with someone, it's just nothing, you know, like what I do. But I mean, when I worked with Brad Kelhammer, um, we were watercoloring on the wall, which is something I've always wanted to do, and I'm like, it does work, you know? <laughs> and that was nice, you know, because then, you know, you just kind of find out what works and what doesn't work. But while getting yeah, paid. the patterns, yeah, while well, getting paid, and that's another thing, is you're, you're making someone else's work, but you're, you're like, this is my job, you know? It's five o'clock, I'm going home, you know what I mean? <laughs> Because there's this kind of like you have to not be too attached yeah. to it, mm -hmm. which is. But it's a romance without the heartache, though. Like you, when you're doing something else, it's what you don't have to worry. Like, he's yeah. good. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All of a sudden, Although I think <laughs> this show, we had a little, you know, you start worrying. I you do. You do. You do. Yeah, you do. But conceptually, you don't have to It's not as yeah. deep a yeah. work. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, but you definitely develop, you try not to have that ownership, but you, you're in there working a little bit more than you have to. No, it's a huge act of empathy, but I don't, I don't feel it's burdensome. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's definitely a different, you know, the innovation is out of the picture. Yeah. It's yeah. like, they say do this, I can do this as good as I want it. I don't have to question whether this is the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which I, you know, which is nice. But um, speaking of tricks of the trade, I think <laughs> you were talking about the solid width installation. Yeah, yeah, I learned I learned a bunch of stuff, but I, I also, I didn't really import any of it into my work. I just thought more of like, people were moving, I'm like, oh, now I can make, I can tape off my wall in my apartment and make it really cool. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I just thought that... You didn't import any of the colors into your work? No, 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 no. Those uh, colors are horrible. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this particular thing <laughs> yeah, I understand they're, like, important, but, um, I just thought... You know, I was just trying to think of the, how I felt when I was doing it. And I thought it was really interesting because the building that we were in was still being built. And so we were constructing this huge work in the lobby. And then next door in, uh, in the building were all these union painters who were in, like, I workers who were building, like, doing all the electrical stuff and painting the room. And, 
by the end of it, um, there was kind of like a, the gallery sort of were forced, to, was forced to treat us like union workers, and we had to like get paid the same as them and everything. And so it's like, when I first started, I felt like really special, because I was like, oh, I'm doing this really special art thing. And then you're there every day with these union guys, and your roles just your role in your head keeps shifting, because at first you're like I'm this artist, and then you're working under we worked under John Hogan, who's worked for Saul for 20 years, and he's done so many pieces, and he's a machine, and he just knows exactly what to do, and there's no question. And we, we didn't even figure it out. Maybe, I thought maybe we would all draw it up together, and stuff. we didn't. He had it all drawn. And then so in the middle, you're kind of like just this art robot. And then by the end, you feel like a worker. I just, because we did it for a month and a half. Yeah, that's, that's so, longer than most. That yeah. was a big piece and lots of layers. I mean, yeah. I thought our nine layers of color were, were a lot. You're doing it with the paint. I'm like, paint would be easier. You won't have to put these <laughs> thin, transparent layers. And it's like, what? Yeah. But you I, made it, you know. Yeah, and we had that same issue, too. You know, you think, oh, I can sort of do this in my own way. But no, there's very, very specific way to do it, and there's no leeway whatsoever. And so it's turned over to you. There's enough rules and enough specific. I mean, we definitely it was like a pat, pat, pat layer, then the white yeah. layer, then the yeah. and then wait, and then, then wait. do it again, and wait, and do it again. So, and it was also interesting because by the time it was done, you know, like a lot of the building was done too, and so it became just this part, this other part. Of I um you know when I'm I, I feel like the freight elevators the like place where you're all you realize okay I'm one of those guys I don't get to use the nice elevator because yeah. yeah. I'm like you know I'm the I go in with artwork for people's offices so I'm not the person in the cubicle or the person in the corner office but then I do you're kind of but I'm also not the guys that are going up to the 13th floor you know to pull to put sheetrock up but then you get on the elevator you're like I'm certainly a lot closer to these guys you know yeah. kind of screw gun level sticking out of the backpack and they're kind of thinking like pack pack. You know? yeah. They have everything on wheels and I'm like, ah, walk around. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it is, it's interesting to um, to have that uh, worker bee side of the artist without having, you know, the, you were saying that makes it easier, but you also don't have the high brain function of, of owner, owning it, which does make you different than just the mechanical manufacturer, which is going to be a great leap in. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I, actually, I think this would be a good time to go over and, and let you talk about these guys in front of them. And yeah, sure. If you'll just take us back to kind of where you were before this body of work, that'd be great. Sure. In regards to the, uh, the feeling of being the unique individual artist and then realizing that you're just a common labor, like all the other guys, uh, where you were doing the work for the soul bit of piece, it's something I've been thinking about a lot past year or so, especially when I started working hands-on with construction, uh, constructing these pieces. Uh, the idea of putting yourself to work when you don't have a large staff to work for you or under you has been very much on my mind lately. You know, like the Murakami types and the other ones who have a large budget to employ people to do their work for them is something that I would like to do. <laughs> well, they do admit it. Because it's uh, <laughs> It's really time consuming to do one by one by one and then you're your own critic and you start uh, editing the work and making crucial decisions you know, on your own time for each piece and eventually it takes a long time to manufacture these. So to tell someone, you know, generate all the cutouts for me and then I'll tell you what color combinations and what types of paints to use would be great. Um, do you think you'd lose some of the wow factor? I mean, I think these are these, are these pieces that really have that like Wow, it took a long time. They have the so personal ridiculous. touch and it does yeah. come through. I mean, I don't mind having the generic manufacturer look for a whole bunch of these and then me stepping in last minute and putting in finishing touches that I would make on my own time if I were working with each individual one. Uh, but I originally am a painter, so transitioning, thinking from paint on two dimension to paint on three dimension has been interesting for me as well. Um, because I had to sort of learn the hard way how to make these things uh, by not having any previous sculpting experience uh, of this sort. 
So, yeah, I had to think of all kinds of materials to find, uh, already found as a found material, or materials to work with, to cut, to, to glue, to, to shape with, and then arrange them all together as one piece, all these separate little entities in one piece. Uh, and some materials like cardboard, foam boards, um, tapes, plastics, velcro, spray paint, enamel paint, all kinds of things that would give it a cohesive look, even though they're all different kinds of materials. They have a definite, uh, I mean, there's it, it, the research into like making them so convincingly part of this world that we see briefly on the side of the, you know, street, Canal Street in New York or something. And I think part of these, I mean, I don't think anybody's looked at these without a little bit of a chuckle. There's a, a built-in sense of humor to them. There's a, I, not, it's not really irony as much as it's this uh, cultural observation. There's this thing that we, you know, you notice, but you, you've stopped this and made us think about like, what is this? Who's buying these? What, what are they, you know, would you really ever believe that, you know, that you had a real Rolex, you know, in the, I remember somebody saying, oh yeah, you can tell real Rolex from a fake one because it's the secondhand smooth yeah. movement. And that's yeah, what really. people say that, and I was like, and <laughs> somebody's going to stop you on the street and check your secondhand? Yeah. Uh, and, and then the whole, you know, some of that, you know, you, you get into a lot of things that are about show and, and how you appear to other people. But then there's the, the industry, uh, your, your cottage industry of making foam core watches yeah. aside, you know, the, where they're coming from and the fact that they kind of appear in every city in exactly the same format. Um, we were talking about just how well they're designed to be closed up and run away before you get arrested. It's all for the purpose of efficiency and a quick get yeah. <laughs> so. so, yeah, uh, and I think that really, I mean, I think if you'd made these things and not had them in the cases and not brought them to the street, in effect, they would have, they would have operated, they would have been just as interesting for us to look at, but they would have, it was a different scenario. You kind of created the, this kind of performance um, ready to happen in here. How you doing? Come in. Oh, I agree, because they could very easily be seen on display uh, windows behind expensive, you know, watch <laughs> seller stores, but uh, putting it in this con on context removes it from the fashion, you know, from the uh, retail source. Um, but the idea of using the foam core material really came out of necessity. You know, I had to find a material that would be cheap enough to buy and work with and also relate to that whole, you know, jump street, you know, uh, found object idea. Um, and I just had to make it in a way that the overall effect would be convincing enough. And first, don't think of it as foam core. Think of it first as a structure and then the material. So with these, um, I know your paintings, the paintings you talked about leading up to this, they, the content, what they were talking about, what you were, the imagery you were bringing into them with the copyright symbol and some um, pop imagery and, and appropriate imagery was, was a, you know, they're kind of about the same subject. And I was curious if um, that, you know, you went to a big, to great lengths to change and do a completely different process because you wanted to get that message or that content or the idea across more, and, or in a different way, or hopefully in a more effective way, which I would, you know, agree that you've done, and, and I think that's kind of an interesting concept to talk about, the whole idea of, like, I want the conversation to be about this, and whatever I have to do, even if I consider myself a painter, if I have to become a sculptor, or a, what, you know, whatever you, you feel is going to bring that subject up, um, you know, that just shows the importance of that idea, and that you want this conversation and the discussion to be about the, you know, the ideas that are really interesting to you that you're thinking about when you're making the artwork. Yeah, when I was uh, working on the paintings, I mean, in their own right, they, they, were, they, they were good and challenging for, for the language that I was working with, paint, uh, acrylic, text. Um, and they were making reference to commerce and copyright logos and all these things that the cardboard is still kind of doing, except I didn't have to work on any text myself. It's already done for me. So I guess that's a transition between the painting and the sculpture. But while I was doing the sculptures, even though I was satisfied with the paintings, I still, the message I was trying to communicate still didn't seem like the appropriate way of making it. Meaning, there had to be some other way other than painting to, to, to uh, make this come across better than painting. So yeah, the transition from painting to sculpture 
came because I figured this, I can't do what I want to do by making paintings, so I had to come up with this. I started slow by, through trial and error, cutting the foam core cardboard and seeing what, how I can make a briefcase. What is it you wanted to do? What was the what thing was you wanted, that I to, wanted do? to do? Yeah, I mean, well, I, that's a, just to try to get, you know. Um, I found every time I go to New York, you know, on Canal Street more specifically, I don't, I'm not really intrigued by the wares that they're peddling, you know, by the wares that they're selling there. I'm more interested in the dudes that do the caring of these products. So whenever Pat and I were, would go window shopping, she would go window shopping, I would sit on the curb and watch these guys do, do their thing. And or I'd go to Battery Park and watch them observe them as well. So I became more interested in the way they operate uh, than in the actual material that they're carrying, even though that's very important as well. So that's what led me to the idea of making the, uh, the uh, briefcases. Um, but then I started, with every visit, I started uh, noticing a trend in the types of items that they actually sell. From season to season, it somehow keeps up with the actual uh, fashion market out there in the world. So I also found that very interesting. You know, what kinds of items do they sell more than others? You know, the sunglasses with the, uh, with the gemstones on them, uh, watches with gaudy diamonds and fake gold or platinum uh, on it. And I just started looking at these objects as individual little sculptures for the, uh, the briefcases. And you, you had also mentioned to me that you didn't want to just use a briefcase. You wanted to stay in the language of the, the whole thing. You didn't, you know, several people had suggested you just find an old briefcase and you put the watches in it. And there was a good, you had a solid reason where, like, why yeah, that wasn't going to work. Even right. though I have been working with found objects like the cardboard or other elements that I've incorporated into the sculptures, if I just come across, a, whether it's a new or beat up briefcase in the trash or anywhere, it's kind of, the work's already been done for me. It doesn't really have any personality to it. It doesn't have any of my likes or dislikes in the way it would make something. And I think that'd be too easy and quick of an answer. So yes, I put myself through the labor of making these, spray painting these, and, and having people complain about the smell of the spray paint. <laughs> but, uh, but it's worth it because it, it's made in a way that I really know to accommodate these objects specifically. So I, I find that's a more appropriate way of working because some because it's a found item doesn't mean it can be used. You have to discard it if it's of use to your work, even though it's found. Well, you definitely have. Add, I mean, there's like little detail on these, which shows me that you've like looked at a lot of these cases and you've picked out the kind of funny things and kept them like the, you know, the spade, heart, diamond kind of little like high roller. Yeah. Kind of detail. I look at the of like fancy. You want? I want to do a silver briefcase. And, you know, yeah, I pay attention to the little scratches and cuts and wear and tear that and the, this, this beat up cases actually have, and try to duplicate that somewhat. Well, which I like that you duplicate it, but you also draw attention to the, the duplication. Like the the repair feels very precise. Like there's a drawing mm -hmm. aspect in the repair. And and the uh, the repair is wasn't just through. Observation of the actual briefcases, but uh, in the previous show that I've had, one of the cases actually got damaged. Oh. <laughs> so I've now reworked it, and it looks intentionally like worn out. Uh -huh. So <laughs> because of the accident, you know, it's, I figured, you know, I know how to make it look like it's not too fussed over to look like it's been beat up. So I have to find a common balance in between. Nice. I guess so. I mean, we, one of the things that um, Denise and I can talk about, uh, which my camera probably won't be able to record, is uh, the this this is a different piece than the one we were formally trained to do. So, even though we've worked with Saul Lewitt's assistants, did you ever meet Saul? No, Lewitt? never. Did you get a? Did they give I you got a piece? It. I got the so he gave yeah. you a painting. Yeah. They, he mails it to you. Yeah. And, and they don't tell you that they're going to. No, mail it and it, you and just in addition it. to. Oh. Getting, getting to work on it and getting paid, you, yeah. you then get a piece of artwork by Saul, which is nice, which is what we use for the invitation for this show. Uh, that was the one I got. <laughs> but uh, this was a, a rules based piece. It basically is called Arcs from Four Corners. And we had talked about wanting to do it together, and we were thinking about what the, you know, which color piece we would do. And we didn't really have the plan, which I think, you know, they're kind of site specific. So, yeah. um, and there was a logistical, um, 
point. We're either going to just have something that we worked on during the, the life of the show and then painted over at the end. Um, but I think we ended up really curatorially making this site specific. We didn't want as much color in the space. We had a very key going on over here. We had a John arm letter on the front wall. And then the, the whole idea of stretching a piece that's normally in a square but says dimensions variable into yeah. this was fun. Denise was a great sport at kind of like taking a day off and racing up here to, to do the other half. So basically it worked out where um, I worked from the two points, the two corners on the right wall, right into the wall, and Denise worked on the two corners on the left wall. And we had to learn like little tricks and how do you fix mistakes, whether you fix mistakes, and yeah. then how you work, you know, on a ladder and keeping tension on this thing. But what were some of your tricks? We we made a little. You made a little. I made a little. little like I, I started off measuring like diagonally across the wall, taping my tape measure to the wall, and everybody here going, "That's not a good idea. <laughs> what are you doing?" And then finally, I figured out that when you start at the top corner, you can measure straight across the top. <laughs> That's what arcs are. You know, <laughs> they're part of a circle. <laughs> so, um, and any radius, you know, you can measure from that point. Well, well we picked the kind of. I picked the five, four inch size. I basically took. You know, looked at an image of the drawing and the rules, and then adapted it. Yeah. Um, but the trick was to just make a tool that could easily, you can change the length of the string, and it had a hole in it. And we made that up. I made it out of a little plastic putty knife handle, and you could wrap it up and measure it. And you did it just become a human compass. Yes. Yeah. You, yeah. So that part. But um, I think that you know, one of the things they ran into with it was just the logistics of kind of at what point in the pattern it got really hard to kind of reach or pull and you'd stop and you'd go from the bottom up and the top down and you know there were and then again just like with some of the other projects what you mentioned it, it you really felt like you were going fast at the beginning and it was going quick this is going to take no time and all of a sudden you get to the mid middle section where you're like this is taking forever i'm not getting anywhere but then there's this anticipation of getting to do the next set of lines. Like yeah. you do one set of lines and it's kind of interesting. And then you do the next set and there's this layer of intersections and patterns. And then one of those sets of patterns gets interrupted by the next in an even more interesting pattern. And so until last night, we didn't really know what this was gonna look like. I mean, we we're pretty convinced it would be interesting, but it just has a completely different feeling. It's kind of like the, the ends of it. It's almost like lenticular glass. You feel like, you know, it's, it's changing yeah. as you look at it, as you move down it, but... Um, well, it's funny because when we were doing the, the, the big cell downtown, we didn't know, you know, none of us really knew what it was going to look like at the end. And we were doing, it was stripes, and so it was alternating stripes. And so you, you do the stripes and you finish the stripes and then you get really excited to oh, take the tape off. off. And that was like the, that was the best part of doing <laughs> the tape off. Because then you see, it's like, oh my god, because we had no idea what it was yeah. going to look like. I also wanted to say how you were talking about how we picked the piece to be and how it was like we, it, we made it like perfect on this wall and stuff. And how when I get I John Hogan, our guy, told us that when Saul was proposing the piece to the building people, how he he gave them like five options and he kind of jerry rigged it so that like, sure. three of them were like just not gonna work at all like he made them really ugly and horrible <laughs> and then so that they had to pick from two that he actually liked <laughs> so, which none of us have ever done yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. so that was i mean I don't know. um kind of, i have a question for you guys yeah. um what i was noticing i think that sort of four inch unit is completely brilliant you know because it relates to the width of the brick and was that a dimension that was variable? Could you choose whether this was going to be, did they have an instructions? Was it that, that wide or could you choose? It didn't say how wide it was. And yeah, basically it I was, arcs, right? yeah, it said arcs, you know, it said from arcs from corners. all four corners. And then, you know, you had this picture of it. And, and it actually was from a collection. And it, I don't think it gave the overall dimensions of it. So it was kind of like looking at it and saying, when it's this big, it had, you know, there's the, in other words, it's not, you know, you were just judging how much white space there was to the thickness of the line. Mm -hmm. So this was what it looked like it was. And then when I came here, I was thinking about it, you know, our wall's like 24 feet long. So I think, okay, it'll be an even number because that just somehow, and then I did kind of slip into a, some sort of a formula where I was like, I think Saul would think about this yeah. like this way. And, you know, you, you 
that was one of the things I thought was is interesting is you do catch yourself doing the I'm going to do this the way that I think this artist thinks as opposed to the way that you might do it. Well, I think also it's funny because when I was saying before how when we got to the downtown and it was um, John had already drawn up the whole thing for us and so we just kind of started and whereas with this it's kind of like we the guy wasn't here when you started but we talked about it a little bit and it's that's that was my idea of what it was kind of supposed to be like the workers come together and unify to make this one thing that they all, it's and it's, it's like they all put equal brain power into it, mm -hmm. and that's what it's supposed to be. That's why the artist gives the idea to the workers, and they're supposed to come up with this one thing and then make it. And so, that it's almost like this has qualities that that other thing didn't even right, have, right. <laughs> because he's been doing it for however long, and it just... It's just what he does now. But, but does that, and I think that's an interesting question in terms of like forgery versus the actual artist, you know, and in terms of like an art historian, who, like you're saying, like, and the guy who works from is sort of the, you know, mach you know, machine and knows, like, and could, you know, could walk in here and say, oh, that's not because yeah. they didn't do this, or that, or the other thing, or like what Susanna was talking with someone walking in and say, well, some of the colors are both, you know, brighter or something than what Barry yeah. would have done or something yeah. like that, too. Well, there's, um, you know, it's funny, this is like from 1971. Mm -hmm. So this is really early, one of the first pieces that he started, like, you know, w was interested in handing off conceptually, like, the making of it along this set of rules. And so some of those are, it's about the rule. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do this, you know, uh, sometimes they're geometric, go halfway, you know, a line drawn from, the name of the piece would be a line drawn from the edge of the square with a bisecting line. You know, they, there would be these kind of, like, the name of the piece was the, the instructions, it was the title. Mm -hmm. And then um, then the color pieces, he ended up, what I thought was really amazing about the, the filled-in color piece that I did in Atlanta was that he didn't put the color in. It was the, for our piece, it was it was layers of transparent ink. And he would build, it's kind of like a CMYK, the system you use when you use um, multiple colors to build up all the rest of the colors. Um, so he, he would have us put down these, this thin layer of yellow, you know, which took three three applications, and then a gray, which was his black, and then a whatever these other colors were, and they build up these beautiful, rich, like burgundies and kind of forest green colors, and these these kind of I guess gem tones. But when he, I asked Sachi, the assistant I worked with, John was mm. at that point he was the guy who put the right. acrylic ceiling finished thing over it when it was all done. But she said, oh, he does it. There were three letter codes in all the, the drawing of the space was in pencil and it was three letter codes, Y, Y, G, G, Y, G, R, I mean, B, B, Y. So it would be like blue, blue, two layers of blue and one of yellow. And he, you could look at it and say, oh, he was doing, there were no two three letter codes next to each other, but there was also like, the yellow would be the first layer if it was next to another one that had layer and um, yellow in it, it'd be at the top. And you could see he was kind of like saying, well, this color in an outburst fashion would like mm -hmm. pull out this color, or push this color this way. And I, to me, that was the biggest amazement was that he had gotten into the system so far that he didn't need to see the color. He could think of what the color was by going, why be be here? And then, be, and then Sachi would do a watercolor rendering for the client who would have no idea what it was going to look like from looking at the yeah. system. And we didn't use the that either. At the end, she just would look up and go, those two I think are a little too close to each other. And she called Saul one time and, and said, I want to change this one to this, and we put one more layer of a color on it out of all of these crazy wow. shards around the thing. So, so for me, that whole, like he really was, the system was driving the colors and it was really yeah. beautiful. It wasn't random because of kind of his responses, but it was, yeah. it's very much like he probably knew that this is like what, when you study waves, you study this diagram, you, it, this is diffraction and diffusion and all these scientific things. But what's really cool is like the patterns make great shapes. And I think he plans, you know, there's a science to it that, and you know, it's not optics and it, as much as it is geometry and, and just the fun with a compass, <laughs> you know. So, hey, I got a string and a pencil, you can have one of these. Got a lot of time and a ladder and some beer, and then, you know, you do a good job. But, uh, so that part of it for me with the color system was really pointed to the, the idea of why he felt comfortable handing this mm -hmm. off. Yeah, the system was so solid and the rules were very specific yeah. and yet, you know, all of the tricks we like about taping. I mean, I learned 
how to tape that edge, and then I showed Gary Simmons how to tape the edge, and then John Armletter, and John, um, there were a couple of people in the free show that didn't know about that, sealing the tape, tape and they were doing hard edge painting, and the installers of the ICA are spreading this soloit knowledge from Atlanta to this other generation of artists to do, you know, the, the, the one with the, you know, using a clear mat, you know, when you're on top of another color to seal the tape so that the line is really perfect. I didn't know. So there's, yeah, so that's, you know, that's the stuff you feel kind of nice about. I was making a, a chalkboard outline for Gary Simmons to do one of those chalkboard yeah. drawings. And he was, he was, you know, we put new, we put a new wall board up at the ICA, which hardly ever happens. And this is our oldest wall here. So I think Solo it would never have this piece happen on this bumpy of yeah. a surface. So our wall was like, this, a, say it was brand new. We couldn't and they touch it. Aqua seal it with yeah. that special paint. Yeah, the guys were in there before doing all this crazy stuff, and then we had to go. It was so white and it was so smooth. And then John was like, "We need to put three coats of white on this wall." On top of that. And don't touch it ever. Uh, yeah, that was, I remember that. There was a guy that prepped the wall for you before you get there. And anyway, all right, well, um, I think that, that that leads into some of what I think Susie touched on, some of the, the ideas of, of how it was to work with Barry. But what about putting this piece up and it's suddenly it's up to you to decide where they go and how many you need and all that? Um, I mean, did you have this kind of shape in mind? I know you, you had the same kind of issues that the rest of us had with, yeah, is it I enough mean, pieces? Have I done enough panels? That's the thing. It's like, you come across this when you're doing your own work. It's like, when do you say when? Like, I can do this. Like, especially when you're working with pattern or you're working site specific. It's like, I could do this for a really long time. You know, and it would still look good. And it's bigger, always better. And I knew it would look good in a corner. Um, cause at the rows, no, it was, of course it was 30 foot, I think it's 30 feet ceilings. At least and 10 feet taller than they need to be. They're huge. And, <laughs> you know, and I had done the whole process from the beginning, which was, it's just Luan and you prime it and you cut it and that, you know, you do that whole thing when you first start working for someone and what size? Do you want it 20 by 30? Do you want it, you know, and you're just asking all these dimensions. I remember like, asking those questions. You know, so. and he's just like, just cut it. You know, and then he would like disappear and I'm like, okay. You know, and so I just, I just came up with the sizes myself and um, he showed us how to make the pattern and the taping and he had picked out all the colors but then he said, you know, go for it. Like, you can make whatever combinations you want to. But then, like, a couple days later, he would say, like, enough white background, like, it's time to do more three-color ones, and, and, like, that was pretty much it. Like, we just made them, and sometimes he would say, make smaller patterns, make bigger patterns, like, I need a big one, and he didn't start hanging it until the last minute. So it's so kind of like, like making the stock. just making it, just making as much as we had wood, which we probably had, like, a dozen sheets. And so I just kind of did the same thing with this, is I just cut them and made them with no plan, and then just put them up in like one day. And then I, I want to make sure we mention the fact that you ended up with this second generation of yes. artist assistants, yeah. like our it's staff just, here. Because it's helped. totally like a process that, you know, you can't, you don't get attached to, and it's something that's very easy to teach, and some people pick up on it right away. Some people, not so much, you know, which I don't run into here at all. But, um, you know, and then I see, like, when people start to help me, they start asking the same questions that yes, I ask yes, Barry, you part. know, like, how's this? Is this okay? You know, because, like, you don't. Did you leave them little notes in the morning? Yeah. It was <laughs> more, you know. Not for the crazy colors. <laughs> I had a little more communication, you know. <laughs> but, um, Still, I tried to pick all the colors just because, um, you know, and I had the catalog, which I would look at sometimes, and I'd be like, you know, but that would just drive me crazy if I really tried to oh, do Oh, yeah, that. I would take the fun out of it. But, <laughs> like, part of me thinks, like, I could do that. You know, I can make it as crazy as I want to. Like, I can, you know, I had the same tape. I had you get the same exact tape that Barry made a huge deal about getting. 
which I had not realized there was. Yeah, you know, it's what the it? delicate... It's the orange, delicate surface blue tape. It's the delicate tape. scotch blue tape. And it does it's make a It's smoother difference. and it's thinner. It's so smoother that, thin. So it's instead of the bumps... Yeah. You know, it's one of those but things... But you can't paint when, it with a roller, we like, found. Yeah, yeah. Because it soaks we, up water. We just did it with foam, foam brushes. And, you know, I... Like, when you first start doing it with him, you're like, oh, man, like, this process is kind of, like, weird. But then you're like, it's the perfect process. Yeah. Like, he, <laughs> you know, he keeps the foam brushes in the paint so you don't have to go through a lot of brushes. And, you know, the tape and the burnishing, and he figured it all out, so. Do you think that I it's, I, I forgot to ask way. you this. I know we, we all commented that down the street on Amory Street, there's like a yeah. black and white version yeah. of this that's been there in the neighborhood on this blank cement wall. Yeah. I mean, do you think this comes from kind of the, do you do these outside at larger scales or um, like graffiti style? He, I've never seen them graffiti style that I know of. Um, I think in the show, you know, he had one of his thrift store brain clusters um, large clusters, and one of them was a framed, like, old yellowing piece of paper with a pattern like this on it, and I think that's where he got it from. Okay. You know, I think it was uh, the cover to some sheet music, and that's when he first saw it, and then just started replicating it. And so he's, he was more interested in this than doing his kind of trademark Faces, it's hard to say what he's interested in. I know it, like, communication um, <laughs> there wasn't a lot of talking, <laughs> and, but um, the other guy I was working with, Eddie, he was more like trying to talk to um, Barry, and I know that Barry said he's kind of getting sick of doing the bottles, the whiskey bottles with the faces on it, but it's a trademark, and he can really do them really fast, <laughs> and they sell for like a thousand dollars a bottle, so you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> empty them out for yeah <laughs> so it's hard to say like what because there was so much going on in that show like he was excited about he really wanted to have a truck on one of the dividers between the galleries on top of it on top of it we couldn't do it you just can't do you it got to burn one in the dumpster out yeah there. so instead we flipped over a truck and put it in a dumpster you know He's someone who totally pushes the boundaries of not only having assistance but having a gallery do whatever you want. Well, you've seen where you come too. in and yeah. you're like, I want this, this, and this. You know. And so he's done it enough to where he goes, there, there. If I ask for things, they'll do them for me. Let me do this. You know. How about you? What we'll do, do that for you this? here at Green Street. You guys just let us know. What? Yeah. <laughs> you just bubbly water, lime flavored water. <laughs> you know, it's a little slow, but I got some today. I'm gonna catch up. Well, um, I, I think that it was interesting with that show. It was like it seemed like a lot of effort to bring, make this thing that didn't comfortably fit in the museum fit in the museum. It's yeah. like yeah, I'll bring cars in, I'll bring all this stuff from the street in, and I'll make like a street scene inside the museum because this is not the natural context for the work. Yeah. Whereas I thought that these did a better job, and I like the you know I like the show. I like the pyramid of TVs and drops yeah. on the screens, and um, but it was interesting because it just is an, a, you know one of the things like Keith Haring and Barry both have to deal with is like this. The cool the factor of like seeing art outside of the context you normally see it, and then when you get big enough, you end up with them, br them bringing it into a museum to show it to the other half of the audience, which are the people that look for art in museums yeah. instead of out on the street. And he said in an interview about the Rose Show, it's like it's a constant battle between like him being dirty and the museum being clean, which is true. Yeah, it's but you get a collection. Yeah. I, it's what, I was always just like cleaning up because it's just like. It's such an implicit being a newer addition, yeah, a newer a gallery guy. to the museum, and it's just like the place was just like a mess. And he would have to leave post a note saying, like, don't sweep this. This is part of like, <laughs> the show. You know, when we smashed the window, um, which was really fun, we smashed <laughs> the window to the truck, and you know, we were all just like throwing sledgehammers at it and stuff like that. And then, like, the janitor would come in and sweep up the glass, and he's like, no, no, <laughs> like, stop sweeping. And so that was kind of funny, too. I'll talk, want to talk about pandas while I'm here? Yes, I would. Okay. But you kind of, you know, last time you wouldn't. No, no, I'll talk so. about pandas. Right, okay. This is stuff I already talked a lot. Um, well, Rob, Rob Pruitt's version of this painting is called Pa, and it's actually... Pa. 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 Um, and it's... Uh, six by 
eight feet. This is half size. I'm calling this ma, and it's, <laughs> and it's, and it's and I'm half size. And I think one of the reasons I was drawn to doing raw food, I'd seen the show Pandas at Bamboo in 2001 when it opened. I think I was drawn to doing the raw food the same reason raw food was drawn to doing like. Who doesn't like glitter and pandas? These like cuddly, adorable, endangered species. And I think that's one of the reasons why, I mean, that is the reason why he did this whole series, was that sort of earlier in his career he had really been taken to task um, when he did a uh, show with um, his partner early looking at um, African American images in the media and how they're co opted by white corporations. It was completely misinterpreted. And he was cynical and racist and essentially like had to like declare public remorse and then he was like fuck that I'm gonna do paintings that everybody likes so it was like a deliberate um, desire half to black kind of, and half white yeah half black <laughs> half white to deflect all sort of like hypercritical stuff on him and did he um, donate some of the proceeds to the world I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure and uh, deflecting his reflection yeah <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, there, as soon as I saw this thing, I was like, you, you can't help but like it. But at the same time, you're like, kind of like, gross. Uh, and, you know, the, the critic Megan Bailey talked about them as like, you know, it's like glitter is just like the perfect material metaphor. Like, if you wanted to get it, like, the, you know, the excesses of the art world right now, about to sort of like collapse under its own like sparkly fabulousness. Yeah, you know, that um, the glitter is. Um, glitter's the way to go. I also have a, a kid that has like a panther bear that's lost a one time. I wanted to make the painting for him. So, <laughs> um, but Rob Pruitt, um, I, I've also worked at the War. I, I thought there was an interesting connection with Warhol and replica to it. I worked, when I out of college, I worked for the Warhol estate. And one of the really interesting things that we had to do was um, go down to the basement of the old factory where all of Warhol's printers were still alive. They were like, we had this like little poker group with all people who used to you know, be Warhol's assistants and printers. And one of the things that like, one of my first days on the job, I was working for the, um, the chairman of the estate and the head of the Warhol Foundation, this hilarious guy named Fred Hughes, who was like the epitome of, he was going to come up with society portraits and glitter. And what they were doing downstairs, they were actually, do, like I walked downstairs and they had like a huge, Huge stack of diamond dust prints of the shoe series, and they were ripping them in half and throwing them they out. Had too many? Because the edition, according to the catalog raisonne, was supposed to be you know, like one out of five hundred, and so and the catalog raisonne had come out, and so like <laughs> they were literally downstairs, they were so, and they're like, oh, you also knew that people were just like wrapping them up and putting them in their coat and walking, walking out. But so the whole idea, so I thought that Rob Pruitt, I mean, I don't know if he was aware of the Diamond Dust series, but I think he must have been, and so that's another reason why I was sort of drawn to, to, um, to, the, to, the, gl to the, glitter, the glitter factor. Um, so this is a pretty straight, I mean, you looked at the piece, you painted from it, and you even the dimensions, is it kind of as direct a... Uh, not yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a half scale. Half scale. It's a half scale. And what I did is I blew up the image and then just transferred it, you know, with blue trace paper down um, onto the canvas. Now, I learned a lot in the process. I now know. I mean, I looked at Rob Pruitt's and their, they say glitter and enamel, which is true. But now I realize that it's most likely, so yeah, I did this all freehand and then went in and painted and put the glitter on. The key, I think what he was doing is what I should have done. <laughs> this is the trick. Right? This is the trick. Is he um, he takes a uh, he makes a mask, a perfect <laughs> mask. You know, has it cut probably by his assistants with a really nice sharp <laughs> exacto knife. So he has the positive and negative. Then he spray. He uses and this is the key. I was using like metal and wood enamel. I'm pretty sure he uses spray enamel. And then he puts the glitter on because that would allow him to do it all in one big swoop and then lift off the mask and then do the other side. The hard thing, and if you see his paintings, they're really super smooth. Occasionally they'll have like little, little glitchy areas, but not quite as bad as his little acne areas here. Um, so um, so, so the, the key thing is how do you like get all that little detail stuff, but then you can't ever have one piece of glitter on top of another piece of glitter. So Because it doesn't thing. glue down? Yeah. So when you stand this thing up, how much of it piled off onto the floor the first time? Yeah. I, I was pretty, yeah, I just shook right away. I had a great teacher in college who made everything do the shake test. Like, should we take our work and like drop it on the floor, shake it, and say, 
a, as an art handler, I would appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, she was like, some, some of you are going to become artists, and some of you are going to thank me in the future. So yeah, I, I shook after him, shook after all of them. Don't worry, Alfredo, we're not going to shoot. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> um, Don't take it by the handle. But the other thing I love about the Rob Pruitts, too, is that, you know, before he did the Pandem Bamboo series, well, first it's just like, it's like totally economically savvy, which I'm completely not as an artist at all. Like, I lose money on all of my shows. I, like, have, like, sold furniture, you know, like, like, no, quick, gotta buy more flowers, you know, sell the, sell my one remaining antique, you know, <laughs> to buy more art materials. Like, just max out credit cards. But he was really, and so there's, like, a nice little alter ego part. Like, I think the cuddly panda bears was his own alter ego, but then, like, to be, like, like really commercially and economically savvy would be, like, my alter ego as an artist, to be able to, like, actually, like, think like that and make work like that. <laughs> um, then the other things, this comes out of the, uh, which I love too is this. He did a whole series called 101 Ways, 101 Art Ideas You Can Do at Home. And this is sort of a play off of number 28, you know, make a painting out of makeup. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love that. was another one of those things where it's like, I give you permission to, to yeah. have crafty, fun projects yeah, that are exactly. still art. And this is my idea, and you go home and make them. So I actually think that Rob Crew would have no problem with this. Be pretty glad to be over there looking at, at the areas going, yeah, you'll get it soon enough, yeah. you know. <laughs> That's great. Well, let's go from the low tech to the super, super high. high tech. How far should the pour go up? And we decided to go three inches underneath the ceiling because if you go all the way up to the ceiling, number one, we thought that detailing might crash the Z Corp computer up there. Um, but if you go all the way up to the ceiling, you actually don't get to see these walls. That's right. You would only see the screw. And we thought it to understand the inside of this, this, the space that it would be great to see. These so you can actually see that. You show me the track lights are kind of just Yeah, they, you can just see the tiny little, the tiny little tracks. Um, we probably have a much better floor plan than we had before you guys measured all this stuff now. But conceptual, and one of the things that I'm, I'm interested in in this work is the idea too of, um, you know, knock off as as replica or what is an addition in the digital age too, when each one is perfect. It's not like a old lithograph where the you know, we'll plate's getting filled in or yeah. da da da, it's that each one is perfect. And then the other thing that interests me vis-a-vis -vis Rachel White Reed is that, you know, when she pours in interior spaces, there's like, there's exactly a one-to-one -one indexical relationship between the thing, the object, the, the positive of the negative space and the space itself. And in these, there is also that weird, it's a, it's a perfect translation of two dimensions to three dimensions, but in the digital realm, because unlike if he's going here to here, it's always an approximation in any other technology that you're using to go from two dimensions to three dimensions. But with this technology, if you model it on the computer, it's the exact same line, but it's just been translated into another form that it is. So there's like this hyper real indexical connection between the digital model rendering and this thing. So you made. measuring is the is the is one transfer point. That is, which is yeah. looser. Yeah. But then once the like we didn't get, in. for instance, there's actually a slight. Th this goes to 21 and a half, like the yeah, so the cement inch. over there. There's a yeah, there's a, like a two and yeah. a five eighths inch slope from that corner to that corner down there. But it would have been not discernible here either. I mean, there's a lot of things that we modeled on here that didn't come in here, like like that little squirter and stuff like that. That just, you know, when you go to 180th scale, it's not apparent. So, <laughs> you, so you could make one full scale? You could. Not this, on the printer. Yeah, because you, you get charges by cubic inch. So the heavier it is. And so when we had to do the full cubic inch to make it um, solid, there's cheaper ways to do it where you can sort of take out the insides. But to make it um, Rachel White, it has to be solid. So the, so the attraction, again, is somebody who's, the, the idea of Rachel White Reed is kind of a straightforward thing. You fill the thing with plaster. Yeah. I mean, it's like a translatable idea, so you feel like you can run with the kind of, her idea is this, and it's this labor-intensive process. Um, you know, it's molding. It's, yeah. You know, a lot of times it's, it's, you're destroying the thing that you mold, and, you know, it's flipping yeah, or space. Yeah, or she's tearing it down. down, or it's getting torn down. But I remember looking at this, and you, you kind of, you do still play the same mental games of like, oh, that's Ooh, the that's closet, right. that's the this, and you're still like trying to figure out what you see and having to reverse it because this is basically this space inside the gallery 
not the outside surface. So yeah. you, you, yeah, it so functions so. like those pieces where you find this great detail and you go, what is that? And you're playing the game of, oh, that's the hinge on the door. That's the Yeah, no, it's closet. a really simple exercise, but it's something like just as a human and as an art teacher, I still love, like, I still love positive negative space. You know, I still love the idea of air being solid, you know, and, and how you make that manifest. So. But the, the other thing I, th I thought was really potentially interesting about these, sort of vis-a-vis -vis my earlier work with Monet, when he was, you know, on sort of every mouse pad and coffee cup and blah, 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 you think that, like, Rachel White Reed couldn't be commodified on some level. But of course, like, the way we work in this culture, like, we, it, it, she can in a way, like, this would be like the gift shop version of Rachel yeah. White Reed, you know, sort of like, the even Bonded she bronze. can get, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I love that. Angelo's David desktop model. So. And there are artists that do portraits where they you scan a figure and they and the fashion it industry like uses that, it a lot. And then you paint them in. I mean, there's like straight, yeah. you know, just like a you know the exact same you know kind of topographical sedimentary yeah. approach. No, and in the uh, you know in the future in the fashion industry, you know all of our clothes will be made perfectly for us just by a, yeah. by a body scan the same. Way, so there's no reason. Like Jane Jetson, when you yeah. put the mask on, <laughs> put the cancer Yeah, the it will be the same. Well, how was it working with a partner? Working, I mean, you basically took on one of the, the things that happens with a lot of this work is that there is assistant. This time it's you're working with your spouse. With my spouse, yeah. And we um, work together, we work together yeah. a lot in other things that I can't. He's keeps some of my things from falling off the wall or hurting people in previous <laughs> um, But it was harder to have him because I, I mean, I know how to do like basic modeling on CAD, but Wait, nothing. this is his world? Yeah, yeah, and I was like, did you get, like, I wasn't sure, like, are you really getting that exit sign? You know, like, you know, like, <laughs> okay, I'm like measuring, you know, the little thing on the door. I'm like, no, you know, I don't think you put in that hinge. But like, you know, <laughs> so. Uh, so, the so yeah, you had to relinquish. Who spent more time? Was he? He was here late. late he was here the, really. He see, was here. It's a turn of the tables. So. Yeah, he was here really late, and then I was the, um, yeah, the tech. I was the measure, like the like little person measuring everything and feeding him the, uh, the dimensions, and then um, then I got it modeled. The hard thing was getting it modeled at Harvard, but because uh, you need, it's actually easy if you know the right, you know the right people. But it's incredibly cheap over there. I mean, this commercial aid, you're going to take it to like the Z Corp place. It would be thousands of dollars to take it to Harvard. It's like 90 bucks. So. Price to be determined. Price to be determined. <laughs> Addition the of one million. <laughs> These are the three artist proofs, which would, of course, be slightly. That's right, more expensive. Well, great. Well, um, any questions? You guys have any thoughtful, anecdotal additions to this? Are we done? Are we off the hook? All right, well, we're going to make Julie and Kanishka do this later. So <laughs> I'm going to make them film it. So thanks a lot, guys.